if the, the tea is boiling and the tea is、uh, brewing, if I pour for you, I would pour a little bit for me. I'd pour back for you and back for me. So it kind of shows that you're you're equal at the table. The year of the tiger. Lunar New Year's celebrations are in full swing, and as part of those celebrations, I thought it was a great opportunity to check in with a young restaurateur, entrepreneur, a really important member of Melbourne's Australian Chinese community. Welcome to the podcast, Yan Anju from Oriental Tea House. Thank you, Danny.、Uh, how are you feeling about the year of the tiger? Good.、Um, oh yes, good. I'm good. I'm feeling good. <laughs> I feel. I feel like a lot of people、uh, in our world at the moment really need this idea of renewal, <laughs> shrugging off the old, and stepping bravely into the new. Yes, definitely. I think so. Yep. Um, so I guess you know I, I understand that you are、uh, currently in isolation because of a reason that we can probably all <laughs> speculate on. So perhaps you're not out there、um, with firecrackers and eating dumplings by the bucketful. But tell me what what、um, Chinese New Year or Lunar New Year means to you.、Um, so we. We have like different traditions,、um, both in our restaurants for the customer side and also like family and、um, with our team. So, in restaurant side, we always do、um, a lion dance every year. Where、um, so the lion, the acrobats, and they come in and they start at the front and they bring these amazing drummers and it's so loud, so chaotic. It's great. And I remember when I was young. My dad would say to me, "Look, the la," because I was scared. <laughs> He'd say, "The louder, the better. The louder it means it's drawing and scaring away the evil spirits. So you want it to be loud." And so with that, we always keep that tradition going. So it starts at the front of the restaurant, and the drums go off, and the the lion sort of dances through the restaurant, and it sort of touches different customers, different tables, and that's really cool because we put、um, like a red pocket. On the table for all、um, all our regulars, and they put like a gold coin or two. And the idea is, you kind of wow the lion to your table. So you would kind of wave it around, and when the lion is there, you want to keep it there as long as possible. So you don't want to just give the red pocket to them. You'd like the because the lion represents good prosperity, good fortune, good health. So you want to keep it around as long as possible. And for the kids, we tell them like pat the lion on the head. It's definitely good fortune to pat the lion straight and then the center of the、um, center of the forehead, and so it would go through and go into the kitchen and as a finale. Now this has always been a tradition, and I think it's really funny.、Uh, one year it did go wrong though, where in China、um, the word lettuce, it's it means fortune. It, it's like a play on word. So as a finale, you would hang a lettuce and you'd strap. The the real red pocket, and this is their, this is their form of like payment. So you strap money in there, or or a check or something, and when you strap it to the lettuce, you would because it's a finale, you would sort of hang it high, just high enough for two people to jump on each other's shoulders, because it's you've to 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 get the good fortune, you do have to you do have to I think work for it, and so that was. Really high up, and then、um, one of the staff members would stand at the top and kind of tease the lion a little bit, so they'd have to try and grab it. And once you grab the, the the lion grabs the lettuce, they'll pull it. At, they'll pull it down. They'll shred the lettuce and they'll throw it into the audience. And if you get hit with a piece of lettuce, it is good fortune. It signifies good good prosperity.、Um, and so one year, the 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 lion grabs the lettuce, and what they're meant to do is they're meant to take the red pocket and. Hold on to that because that's their payment, and then throw the lettuce. But he accidentally, all together with the payment and everything, just threw it out into the restaurant. <laughs> and he goes, "Oh no!" And I saw it. I saw the red pocket go woo, like straight out of the mouth and into the customer. And he's like, "Oh no! Oh my gosh!" And starts hunting. So it's all. I think it's very fun. It's just like all these crazy stories you'd have, and I think that's what Trendy News is about. Uh, I love it. It's yeah, I love the vibrancy, and I I reckon it, I actually love the noise. I mean, so often when we think about ceremony and tradition, there's this sense of awe and hush. But I I love um yeah, I just love the cacophony that um that comes along with some of these Lunar New Year traditions. Yeah, definitely. And the firecrackers at the end, like that's very. It, it definitely catches a lot of attention on Chapel Street. A lot of people <laughs> usually we have bratty rallies across the road, always looking at us like, what's happening over there? Yeah, fantastic. And what about、um, food traditions, Yanan? 
Mm. So in, of course, Chinese New Year, you have to have dumplings because dumplings, the shape of it, it looks like a gold, um, how do you say it? Like a gold, uh, back, back in the day, they have gold. Like a money bag. Yes, correct. So you'd eat those. You have plenty of duck and chicken, prawns, lots of fruit and veg. So like every year our teams, they cook up a big feast um, for, for our, for like the team together. Probably a bit different this year, but they would get everyone together and have a big old feast. Um, yeah. So I think for food, definitely dumplings. Yeah, perfect. And so, Yanan, so you, your, your family has Oriental Tea House and also David's, the restaurant that's named after your father. So I know that you've pretty much grown up in the business. T- give us a little insight into that. What's it like being a kid in a restaurant family with a father who's, who's building this empire? Oh, yeah. Um, so actually not many people know this. David's restaurant, before it was David's, uh, used to be a warehouse. And this warehouse used to hold all the teapots and tea and teaware um, for his tea shop, uh, which used to be on just like, I think, 10 minutes from where the where David's is. Um, and when I was young, I really young, I didn't really understand um, anything. But this warehouse and this one cute teapot, I remember, was my whole world. It was a tea because these teapots are handmade, so they're one of a kind. And this, I remember, this cute green teapot had a teapot inside this teapot. It was it was insane, and I just wanted it. I didn't want to lose it, and I knew that like every time he brought certain types of tea, I just knew that if he brought it to the front, I won't see it again because I knew he would give it to customers or something like that. I just wouldn't. So I would always he'd bring it to the front, and I, he wouldn't know. I would take it. And then, and I had like a little area in the back I could play with. It was just like a little bed that my grandma would like make sure I'm sort of taken care of on. And I would hide it under the bed. And then, you know, over time, my grandma might find it, put it back out onto the, onto the table where like they, they would sort of um, organize the teapot. And he's like, I thought I brought this out yesterday. And he put it back to the front. And then I would sort of come to the front and take it back. Like this teapot, oh, it, we still have it. He didn't end up, I, I got it. Like it's You won here. in the end. I won. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, and then in terms of like floor, I started at a pretty young age. Like when I was a teenager, um, at the time in my head, I just wanted to get some work experience. I wanted to um, meet different people. Uh, I learned a lot. I learned, um, I learned how to, I guess, um, I, was, I was quite shy. I still am. Um, and so I learned, I think, how to, have conversation and mentor. It sounds so basic, but just maintain eye contact and sort of that was definitely as a teenager, good to experience um, that floor work. I remember one year when I, I I started working in the Chapel Street store and then I got put to the little Collins Street store just for, for some reason. And I remember I got there, but then when I got there, I didn't know how to find my way back. <gasps> I was kind of stuck <laughs> in the city and I was like, how do I come home? I didn't know what trams to take. So that was, I think, yeah, it's, it's all good because it all kind of builds you. And then of course, like when I got into my twenties, um, I didn't go to, I didn't do uni. Um, I tried it and my dad said to me, I remember he said, he's like, look, why don't you give this a shot? Like, let this be your uni, let this be your, um, training. And I, and I tried it and it was, it was really great. But yeah, I remember my twenties. That's when we like around the same time we'd open Zuzu bar, uh, and lots of late nights there. So I remember we'd finish at like 2 AM, uh, and then, I, I just, I felt bad because like, if I had to get home, I would ask my dad to come pick me up at two. And as if that wasn't enough, I'd then make him send home all the team members before me. <laughs> so, and he did it. He's great. So I would just say like, it's, um, it's, it's really cool. Like it's all, and now obviously different now, but, um, yeah, I just feel like if you are like at all stages of my life, Tea House Davis has always been there in like a different sort of form. Yeah, it's so interesting because I guess, you know, a lot of, you know, I know that David came from Shanghai and, um, you know, he was a, worked as in Chinese medicine before he opened the restaurant. He's, you know, had a, had a real journey. And I think it was one of the, yeah, really elevated tea as a, as a phenomenon or something that, you know, 
people who perhaps didn't have that Chinese background and were, were didn't know as much about it as he did, you know, could really access it in a really different way. He certainly brought a lot to Melbourne's food culture. But I think a lot of um, immigrants at open restaurants, they, you know, there's this idea that their kids will do something else, that they will go to uni, that they'll, you know, take on one of those traditional professions that parents are supposed to want for their kids. I mean, it's it's really interesting that he actually, you know, um, recruited you into the university of the restaurant. Yeah, and I, I think it was great. I, I don't know. I would people ask me if I regret like not going to uni or I, I I feel it's definitely in terms of life experience. You're full of it. Like you have you get plenty of that in the restaurant. And I think because you meet so many different people um, as well. Like you you learn different things from just meeting. I think um, a vast amount of um, professions just from people coming into the restaurant every day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and every day is different and, you know, yeah, it's so many different skills that you, yeah, pick up along the way. And I suppose also, you know, if you've got an interest, you're able to follow it when you've got, you know, diverse business such as, um, such as the Oriental Tea House Group. Yeah. Yes, yes, definitely. I think we're very lucky with that. Tell us about the, the role that you play in the business today. Um, so when um, uh, I remember when... Okay, so I remember when I was learning to host in Chapel Street and um, the manager at the time, uh, he said to me, he's like, oh, this family right there, please look after them. And I was quite young, so I was like, oh, how come? What's What makes them, I think, uh, particularly special? And he told me, this is back then, that was 15 years ago already. So we're talking like 20 years ago. Um, he said, the woman and the, and the, and the man, they came in um, and I had mistaken them to come together when really they were coming with different partners. So they came in and he's like, oh, table for two. And it turned out to be completely um, wrong. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. And then he said, I remember the following week because it was such an awkward encounter. Um, when they came back, it was, um, it was them two again. And so he remembered, he's like, oh, table for two. And they kind of laughed it off. They're like, yes, well, you know, after you thought we were together, we kind of got talking. Um, and then we, yeah, this is our first date. And he was like, oh, wow, awesome. Well, come sit at this lovely corner table I have for you. And he's like, I remember over time they kept coming back and they kept coming back. And then for a period of time he didn't see them and she comes back and she's got a ring in her finger and she's like, we are engaged. And it was, it's beautiful. And then after a while, she, he, he, you know, because time passed, he sees her come back and she's pushing a pram and she had a beautiful baby girl, so sweet. And now fast forward 15 years, this was where it got funny. This beautiful baby girl who we've watched grown up from such a young age and because all our um, teams and our managers there, we're, we're really, we do stay long-term because we love, we love uh, just being in the company. We love each other. So it's very, um, this one manager, because we knew the girl from when she was, imagine watching someone from seven, like eight years old, 10 years old, at around 14, 15, I think she would have been. She comes in with a boy and he's like, oh, this is not okay. So he called the mother because <laughs> we got her on on the VIP list. He called her and was like, do you know that your daughter is here with the girl? <laughs> and I was like, you can't do that. <laughs> um, but it's so sweet because it's, I think that's what, Really, I, I'd like for Orange Tiaz, that's what we hope to do. We want it, we hope that she would find her partner and she'd, she'd, because Tiaz has been around for a while, we hope we're around for much longer. And we just want to make sure that, like, you know, we're a part of everyone's um, lives in some way. And then she starts bringing her friends in. She's wearing makeup, which is crazy. But I think that's what's really sweet is that, um, because in, in Shanghai, um, we don't really have pubs or we never really had pubs maybe different now. So a tea house is kind of like the place where you would, um, for social interaction and meetings, it's, it's more so when you, and I remember my dad tried to explain it to me and he couldn't. So he actually took me to um, Shanghai and he took me to the tea house and it's, it's amazing. I remember he, he said, okay, so tea houses in Yunnan is not meant to be quiet. It is not meant to be, um, sort of slow and, and almost timid. It is meant to be loud and energetic and almost chaotic. And I didn't really get what he meant. And so I remember in the tea house in Shanghai, when you open the doors, there is, you're just hit with like noise and smoke because you can smoke in there and smoke. And there's just like so much energy. It's great. And that's where you have all these different people from different backgrounds. They're having meetings, going on dates. It's very much the place to interact. And so for Chapel Street, in winter particularly, um, because I felt that we really wanted to replicate that same feeling. And it does happen in winter. It's awesome. So like the doors obviously would be shut, 
the front. And so the idea is when a customer comes in, when you push open those doors, you're literally hit with the smell of dumplings. You're hit with the warmth because we've got the heaters on. You're hit with the music, the vibe, the energy, and it's all sort of going on in there. And that is kind of, I think, what we've always tried to create in Melbourne is just a place to interact, a place to socialise and, yeah, somewhere where you'll have lots of different interactions with um, your loved ones, um, your boyfriends, your exes maybe. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's what we, that, that's Someone what might call your mum. Yep, <laughs> yep, yep. You just just make sure <laughs> you <laughs> you check with your parents before bringing your dates to our venues. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. Wow, you've just you've just really uh, enveloped me in this whole world of the Oriental Tea House, you know. And it's just so so great. I really get the feeling of what it's like for you, you know, to grow up in that. And, and just again, this university of, of, you know, of, um, of hospitality that your father's put you through. Um, I mean, imagine not being able to explain what it's like. So it's like, okay, we're getting on a plane. I'm going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yes. <laughs> I'd love to talk to you about, you know, I, I feel like there's something I'm thinking a lot about at the moment is this whole idea of fusion and about the way that, um, I feel like a few years ago, fusion was kind of a dirty word, but I feel like it's being reclaimed in a sense by a whole lot of people that are, I don't know whether it's a confidence or whether it's the fact that diners are up for it, um, whether it's the fact that, you know, it, it's so much, there's, su- you know, the world is such a melting pot now. I don't know. Like, I mean, because obviously you can't recreate something from Shanghai in Melbourne you can bring elements of it but I mean how does how does that interplay work do you think between the city that you 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 plonk a business in and and build you know with a community around it and this sort of concept that you've borrowed from afar Mm. I think um especially recently you're right a couple of years back it was I think um, sort of meant something else. But now I feel like it is, it's getting more and more diverse. Like I know in our teams, it's so diverse and it's great because when we sit down and have our team meals, like the conversation never stops because you learn lots of things about different cultures and backgrounds. Um, I reckon that definitely plays a part for, for I guess how it's done and how we can keep sort of pushing towards that way is um, just, uh, I don't know the word, but maybe um, little bits of, um, uh, bits of um so a good example is when in china when we have tea um you the the tradition goes you usually drink tea with someone um you're very intimate with or like you're you love very much um whether family um again like husband wife and so when you're drinking the tea even if it's a business partner you the strength of the tea it represents more than just i'm having a cup of tea with you it sort of means like I, if I'm if the, the tea is boiling and the tea is uh, brewing, if I pour for you, I would pour a little bit for me. I'd pour back for you and back for me. So it kind of shows that you're you're equal at the table, or it, it, it sort of just senses that like it doesn't matter what background we're from, doesn't matter what experiences we've had at the moment at this point in time where we're drinking this pot of tea, the equal strength of tea represents the equality, like the equality between you and that person you're having the tea with. And I think it's a very unspoken. Um, understanding of it and I think we try and bring sort of bits of that and of course we explain that to our team members and the team members would then pass it on to the customers but I think that's how it's sort of the best way of fusion is sort of through through that I think instead of just uh, literally marrying a hamburger with a dumpling like that that doesn't work but I feel like it's more those uh, little uh, bits of culture that um, might mean a lot in one in one um, area you can sort of bring in and then you can have the same experience um, or here in Melbourne over the same yeah. yeah that's so interesting I love that idea of you know how meaningful the, that pot of tea is and maybe there is something in that it's like you're not just I, I suppose imposing an idea on someone you're really bringing them into to a story and and to you know something that has a really rich cultural background yeah so interesting um so uh what I'd love also just to talk about, you know, restaurant culture in Melbourne generally. Like, I mean, where do you, it's obviously, you know, we're in a big rebuilding phase, hopefully. Um, how do you think things are feeling out there? What are, what are you hearing from people? Um, I, I definitely feel this year's um, a bit more uh, challenging just because I remember like the first, the first year of lockdown when that happened, there was very much unknown. Like the, there were things that 
um, all industries had to do, like especially after Taylor, like being forced to close. It was so unknown that there was also a bit of like uh, kind of like a go, go, go mentality because you you come from working um, seven days, oh, not seven days, sorry, five days a week. Like you're constantly going and then suddenly everything goes to a stop. So you still have that energy in you that you want to do something about it. And I feel like the first year was very much like that. And then the year that just passed, the second year of it, we, we, we actually sat down with our team and calculated how many weeks of lockdown we had. We had 17 weeks last year in total if you put them all together, uh, which is crazy. But that was also like I feel whatever foundations that was made in the first year for so many people wanting to um, try takeaway, try cook at home, they were able to test out those um, kind of those those offerings in last year. And that kind of kept going and then you sort of spun right into reopening, which was very exciting for so many people because we were able to open the doors and really push it. And then this year I think it's it, – I'm still – sort of in the middle of it but I think it's actually more harder because a lot of we're actually juggling health with work this time like yeah. a lot of people are getting sick and the like myself but then it's not just myself it's health on one part but also the health of my team for the amazing team members I've had to stand up while I've had to sort of recover at home so I think health in all areas and not just those who are going to like who got COVID or who gets it so I feel like it's actually quite hard at the moment and that's kind of what I feel is there is a little bit of, but it's, it really, it's great. Like the team, they still push, they pivot and they're very agile, making sure that we, we stay ahead. Um, but it definitely, you can feel it with um, the health, when you put health into the mix, it's that that's number one. You just want to, you want to make sure everyone's healthy. Yeah, it's really true. Cause I guess, you, although we've had all this dis- disruption and lockdowns and, you know, the enormous financial and emotional and mental health implications of that, it's like still, you know, until, you know, this Omicron wave, you know, a lot of people wouldn't have even known anyone that had COVID. And, of course, that has completely changed now. And luckily most people aren't getting that unwell, but some people are. And, yeah, it's, um yeah, so there is that health aspect as well as, of course, the business disruption. I mean, you know, you mentioned you're shy, but you've obviously, you know, you're a, a ex- extraordinarily capable and, you know, uh, you have this ability to, to speak to customers and speak to people. But how how have you managed to be a leader through this, you know? Uh, ooh, <laughs> um, I think maybe uh, we, for our, our team, I think we give them um, and we make it together. We even through, so we, before lockdown, we'd always have um, a regular meeting where all the, all the managers get together once a week. Um, and we just discuss what happened the week before, what our plans are for the week ahead. When lockdown went in, um, we, we, we feel that, I feel, what's the word, routine. It's hard not to lose that routine and to keep sort of, um, I think those key, key um, pointers ongoing. Because there was one thing that my dad said to me is like, if you go and sort of, I think what they were saying, some, if let's, if you not take a nap, but if you go into hibernation or something like that, be be weary that you may not wake up. And I felt that he said that to me at the very beginning. Wow, that's really intense. <laughs> It, yeah. And I was like, okay, we will not go into hibernation. We will do whatever we can to to keep pushing and to push forward. And I feel like that that really got us through it because it is like you you get into a habit of doing one thing one way and then it's you got to break that habit and do something a new way. So I think for us, we definitely kept together as a team all the time. We Communication was vital. I was always on my phone making sure that like if say when JobKeeper kicked in and people weren't really understanding how to do it, we called every single one of our 70 staff members just one by one just to make sure they really knew what was going on and they felt safe. They felt that, okay, like, you know, I know what's happening. So that happened so many times throughout the years. So we're a lot closer, I think, as a company now. Um, But I feel that sort of planning and um, but doing it together as a team is really important. And also looking back. Mm. Looking back? Yeah. Yeah. Just looking back at what works, what doesn't. I think um, I, I am big on, uh, I got this from my mom. She tells me numbers never lie, you know, and I was like, yes, I used to try. And when I was young, I try and I was very good at sort of being like, look here, look how good I did even if I didn't achieve any sales targets. So she always said to me, numbers don't lie, you know, and I was like, oh, sorry, mom. <laughs> Keeps you accountable. Oh yeah. hundred percent. But that she, she's right. We, we, we would look back at our figures. We'd sort of, I think the most recent is this, um, this January and this February. We need to look back to see how, um, 
how the company's performing. Just it's a new environment again. We we keep getting thrown into different environments that have different um, kind of uh, characteristics. You can say like it's always a certain type of character in that particular like environment. So you have to change the model, and then once the model changes, you find a bit of um, sort of uh, consistency in it. And then once that changes again, you got to do it again. So I feel especially this time back with health, um, we have to look at the model again and um, adapt quickly. Wow, amazing. Uh, so when you come out of isolation, do you, are you going to like rub your eyes and creep out like a sleepy bear or are you going to spring out like a tiger? I, <laughs> um, I think the first thing I'm going to do is I thought about it because I was like, oh, what am I going to do as soon as I get out? I just want to go to the park. And I just want to, because I've, I've actually lost, I can't smell much. I just want to inhale and just smell gross. It sounds so weird. I've got very bad hay fever. So anyone who knows me is going to think I've like gone insane, but I just want to smell something fresh other than my, well, like my home. So yeah, it's, but of course, in terms of work, I'm going to need to catch up with everyone. We're just going to sort of check in one at a time and what's happened in the last week or week and a half. Wow. Uh Amazing. It's so great to talk to you, Anna. Is there anything else that you'd like to say? Uh, no, thank you. That's no. Thanks for chatting with me. It was um, it was really nice to have a chat with you. Yeah. Well, congratulations on everything that you've achieved as a as a family and as an individual. And um, yeah, I just uh, look forward to eating more of your family's great dumplings. Um, and yeah, all the other beautiful food as well. Uh, yeah. And um, yeah, happy new year. Happy New Year. Thank you, Daddy. My dad always says that um, you uh, you make so much contribution to hospitality, truly. He he says that all the time. And like, just I, I, I follow you on Instagram, so I really believe it. Like you always, I think, um, say exactly what's, I think, happening at that time being and what needs to be, I think, said that. Yeah. So no, thank you. Well, there'd be, there'd be nothing to talk about if not for people like you. So um, thanks for the kind words. <laughs> No, of course. Thanks. Take care. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This.